Welcome to The Indigenous Approach, a podcast where we examine the role of the nation's premier partnership force across the competition continuum, from cooperation to conflict and everything in between. In this episode, Brigadier General Steve Marks speaks with five alumni of the command's Young Lions Leader Development Program. I'm Brigadier General Steve Marks, uh, the Deputy Commanding General at First Special Forces Command. And for this episode, I'm honored to be speaking with five alumni of our Young Lions Leader Development Program. So we have with us today, Lieutenant Colonel Carl Benander, a Special Forces Officer and Commander of 1st Battalion, 3rd Special Forces Group. Lieutenant Colonel Brian Wong, a Signal Officer and Commander of the 112th Signal Battalion. Major Nicole Alexander, a Civil Affairs Officer, currently serving as our Secretary of General Staff. Captain Kara Hawkins, a Logistics Officer, and commander of HHC 4th Battalion, 1st Special Forces Group, and Sergeant Major Chris Miller, a Civil Affairs NCO and the Operations Sergeant Major of the 92nd Civil Affairs Battalion. I'm glad that each of you could join me today and talk a little bit about the Young Lions and leader development uh, in general. So let's dive straight in. First, I wanna explain to the audience what the Young Lion program is. Young Lions was started by USASOC in uh, 2012 when Lieutenant General uh, Charlie Cleveland created the program to give young captains who had demonstrated strong potential a chance to interact with the USASOC command and staff. It was originally around 12 uh, to 11, excuse me, 11 to 12 officers per year. Uh, in 2019, First Special Forces Command took over the program and it expanded in both size and with regards to the rank levels. We hold two sessions a year, one in the fall and one in the spring with 22 officers, NCOs and warrant officers selected to attend the week long event. And we've set up the program to integrate five key elements. So you think of these as the secret sauce that makes, the, makes this different than any other leader development program we have seen. We bring together rising stars in the command, really the superstars, uh, but ensure to include diversity of people and perspectives to get everyone thinking broadly. We expose them to participants. Uh, we expose the participants to outside influences like business leaders and strategic thinkers. Uh, the program helps establish a three-dimensional network between those leaders and in industry, the Young Lions and the command team. Fourth, we expose our Young Lions to executive communication principles like uh, listening, uh, present listening, and lean executive level communication. And then lastly, we foster a peer-to-peer -peer community amongst the Young Lion alumni over the long term. So we stay connected with them and they stay connected with each other. My first question is out to uh, Captain Kara Hawkins. Uh, you attended uh, the one, the, you attended one of the most recent Young Lions events. Uh, can you explain to the audience uh, what you experienced uh, when you uh, participated back this past fall? Yes, sir. So I participated in the most recent Young Lions event uh, like General Mark said in the fall, and we connected using a, a hybrid learning model. There was some of us virtual and then others were there in uh, Southern Pines, North Carolina at the Brief Lab headquarters. Uh, the Young Lions Leadership Seminar really connected us across the command, like I said, virtually and in person. And additionally, this fall, the uh, command also incorporated talented non-commissioned officers, warrant officers, and um, other talented officers throughout the program. And I would say this, this program um, really had an overarching theme of executive communication uh, through the brief lab, as well as uh, exposure to, even though it was hybrid, uh, exposure to corporate industry leadership and organizational models. And then we also received mentorship from, from senior leaders throughout the first SFC command during this, this week. Okay, thank you for your perspective. Um, for Major Alexander and Sergeant Major Miller. Now first uh, to Nicole, can you provide some input on how you uh, how the program has expanded? I believe that you were in pride number two or number three back at the beginning of the Young Lions program when it was first stood up. And then for Sergeant Major Miller, can you talk a little bit about uh, your perspective as the NCO? Yeah, so uh, you got it right, sir. I was in pride number two under General Cleveland when we first started and uh, each one was very different then, I think, and where we're going with First SFC, First SFC is great in that in continuing to engage the young lions, right? Being able to uh, not just have that one week event, but also what else can we get you involved in? Reaching back to all the alumni, which we've been doing a lot recently. Um, I think we're up to like 70 to 100 something alumni and young lions over the last five years. And so 
um, it's important to, as we are, you know, as we're really investing in everybody and these people and these rising stars, how do we continue to educate and develop them and then really use their talents. And so that's been the great thing that I've seen um, so far with First SSD is, is looking for that input. You know, we asked uh, for input on the vision um, that just got published a few weeks ago. Uh, we've also gotten some input on, um, on some focus areas for the command and for CSUs, what, uh, and even some integration with some, uh, some things that the SWIC is working on as we head up um, and identify some concepts to, to use the SOC. And I think that's really the important part of this because you know, I got a little bit of that um, myself when, 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 we were, when the program was just started and it has had, I mean, just those little types of exposures have had incredible impacts on my future and who I am as a civil affairs officer and a leader in the command. Um, so it's important that we do that uh, for us in First of 60. And for Chris, uh, you know, I, Chris and I worked together um, back in the 92nd and, uh, and when it was opened up to NCOs, it was like, Chris is the man, like he has to be a part of this program. Uh, so I was really happy to see uh, to see that he was, and so I'll let Chris, uh, you know, talk about it from his perspective um, there. Sure, thanks. <laughs> so for the September uh, cohort was the first cohort to uh, host non-commissioned officers. So I viewed the selection um, for the young lines as not only as an honor being one of the first NCOs for the program. Uh, but to be uh, an opportunity to be a trailblazer for NCOs chosen for uh, future cohorts. Um, the NCO officer relationship is one of the most um, critical relationships in our profession. So when the Young Lions program uh, being the first Special Forces Command's premier professional development program made it open to non-commissioned officers, um, it was a great uh, a step forward in my opinion. Um, because now with this approach, you're not only getting uh, talented uh, commission officers coming back to the force, but now the uh, enterprise is going to reap the benefits of non-commissioned officers uh, ready and aimed uh, with this newfound knowledge. Um, matter of fact, based on the training that I received out in uh, Southern Pines in September, I've already started making uh, minor tweaks to my organization based on the, the training that we received in effective communication and time management. Um, as we all understand, uh, uh, the precious commodity of time, once you lose it, you can't get it back. So the training that I received allowed me to give that time back to my, my unit leaders. So I would submit that the Young Lions program uh, needs to continue investing in the non-commissioned officer corps, uh, finding those high-performing non-commissioned officers at the E8, E9 uh, positions. Uh, from their respective uh, career management fields to uh, take part in the uh, Young Lions program. No, thanks. Yeah, sir, and, and John, if you don't, if you don't mind too, the great part too about, you know, make you guys making the decision to open up to NCOs is when we do that reach back, when we do ask for Young Lions input, now it's not just a bunch of officers, right? Now we're, now we're getting the NCOs the warrants in the feedback when we're looking at concepts and it's an easy touch point and that's exactly what we need because they are the backbone of what we do they are in our organizations and on our teams and companies for much longer than the officers so it it makes it pretty incredible um, opportunity for first sfc to have those easy touch points with these uh strong ncos is you know the the other thing i'd ask and, and i'm going to bring in uh, uh both lieutenant colonels to kind of jump in on this one is how does this compare to other leader development programs that you've experienced in the past yeah thanks sir um it, it's definitely unique uh from my perspective uh and i think one of the things i valued most and i'm glad to see sf command uh continuing this and expanding this is the connection to external organizations leaders talent uh, in other industries. Uh, those are experiences that you just don't get, I think, anywhere else in the military uh, except a program like Young Lions. It's certainly something that is difficult for us to set up at the, at the subordinate unit level and incorporate into professional development. Um, it's also, you know, really valuable to get the senior leader engagement and the mentorship but I really appreciated the focus uh, in something different, somewhat innovative in its approach uh, that wasn't just standard uh, military professional development that we're doing at every other echelon. So to me, I, I think that's great. And I, I think something that, that has to be sustained uh, if we're gonna build a culture of innovation and uh, uh, adaptive leaders going into the future. 
Uh, thanks, Carla. I appreciate that. And to Brian, uh, how does this compare to other uh, leader development programs that you've experienced in the past? Sure, I, I would say it's probably one of the top ones. So I had a unique uh, uh, coming into soft, coming from the conventional side, I went straight to an Army SMU. So what I experienced as LPD programs is very much what Carl just mentioned right there. I um, mean, and, and really what I learned from the get-go in Pride 2 was the power of the network and really the relationships. And I know it's uh, uh, it's grown a lot since then, but uh, you know that's where I met Carl. Uh, that's where I met Nicole. Uh, I met uh, Colonel Stu Ferris there as well too. Um, and as over time, as uh, stayed in stock, that continual investment in there and the relationship piece has paid dividends, not just professionally but operationally as well too. Because you know we know as if, as we get to know each other in uh, in young lines that we can pick up a phone and call that right person. Like, hey, I need, I need some help. I need some ODA help. Hey, I can call Carl and Carl might be able to help me out. Or he can call me for comm support or unique challenge that he has. And I think that's the really big thing because it brings everyone together from across the enterprise. Um, vice, uh, when you're in a BCT or a RISA battalion like I was. Um, and I think that's real, the, the big power, what set it apart for me as I got indoctrinated in the SOC. No, I agree. It's all about the power of relationships. And I'm, I'm glad that you both highlighted that. Um, so for, for both of you, Carl and, and Brian, this podcast is called The Indigenous Approach, and that normally refers to how forces use relationships with foreign partners to conduct operations or accomplish a mission. I would say think about the uh, horse soldiers in Afghanistan following 9-11, but this program also uses an, an Indigenous approach when it comes to pairing young leaders with a different kind of partner, including corporate leaders or big thinkers in the field. What is the value in having the kind of partnership for a leader development program? Sir, I mean, I think first and foremost, um, talent is talent and leadership is leadership. And, and we can learn from talented leaders uh, in any field and, and appreciate seeing some of those different perspectives, uh, the different challenges that they deal with. Uh, they face, um, you know, problem sets in different environments and, and, and things that give you just a different perspective. Um, I definitely appreciated uh, hearing how they utilize people. Uh, and it, I think the, the, the military is starting to confront, you know, a uh, population that's much more mobile, much more connected, has many more options uh, maybe than we were when we were first growing up. Uh, and being able to engage and empower uh, people and leverage that resource, um, they have to compete uh, with other organizations uh, to keep that talent, uh, keep that talent engaged. And, and that was one thing in my Young Lions experience that was, that was very interesting. Um, and then with the proliferation of, of technology and things, those connections are important as well um, with, with other organizations that are working in some of those fields that, that may have application uh, in the military, in SOF, uh, that, that we can look at how they develop technology, how they innovate, uh, things like that, uh, I think are, are very valuable uh, in terms of development and uh, building, building solid relationships. One, one of the questions I would have for Brian is, in your battalion, Brian, how do you connect uh, leader development with innovation? So we use it as a kind of a, a, a launch point to really get after uh, intellectual curiosity and freedom of thought to uh, really just take the reins off of people um, and let them think of unique solutions to challenging problems that uh, that we have in, in Army Special Operations. And I, and I think what that's done is help give us a, a much broader diversity of thought, especially when you have a bottom-up approach to innovation um, and we talk about that and we live it and we make sure that uh, we take a resourcing approach that people have those really good ideas uh, that, that might have application, that we really take a look at it um, and, and build it into the culture and the environment uh, within the 112 Signal Battalion as well. Um, and, I, and I think that's absolutely key going forward because uh, I, I want to make sure, at least in the battalion, that we avoid a lot of groupthink uh, because sometimes uh, if you don't have that outside perspective, whether you're paired with uh, uh, a big thinker from industry or a CEO, uh, if you miss that piece, then you tend to come up with maybe just iterations on something better, which is more of a modernization issue. You really need that diversity of thought with uh, 
with outside leaders if you really want to innovate uh, and really take big leaps ahead. And so that's what we're uh, kind of taking a look at as we look through the Rolodex of technology leaders that we know, and even non-technology leaders, is making sure we have, it, have that diversity of thought, uh, not just in the officer ranks, but the warrants and the junior soldiers as well, too. No, and I think, I mean, across the, the whole RSOF formation, I think we do a great job in bringing in um, deep thinkers, those that are at the cutting edge of technology, and then we have them share either through brown bag lunches or LPDs, where we have them share their ideas and their thoughts. And then I think we also use them as kind of a, uh, you know, pitch ideas to get their get their feedback. Are we going down the right road? Uh, so I, I do I appreciate your comments on that one, uh, Brian. So in the last episode, the last Indigenous Approach episode, episode two, Major General John Brennan, the commander at First Special Forces Command, said that in the future we will be asking captains and master sergeants to do things the army in the army now that has 05s and 06s doing and that we will need a power down authorities for younger leaders to accomplish more so for sergeant major miller uh, is this will this be a welcome change uh, sir i think the change is welcome it will be welcome and matter of fact i think it will be uh, welcomed with uh, open arms um, our soft soldiers desire assignments of missions that allow them to uh, operate uh, with minimum oversight. Um, however, without trust, you know, which is a central attribute of mission command, freedom of movement becomes restrictive from superior leaders. But I would submit that the trust level there is, is there right now at the E8, the, the, the 04 level, uh, things that uh, were expected of 05s, um, the trust is there. That empowerment um, of the subordinates without micromanagement is only possible when trust is, uh, is there and, and I believe is there. Um, as we know, trust is that proverbial glue, just hinging on um, mission command incorporated with the understanding of the mission, the mission intent. So I, I think, sir, that we are ready. Um, just looking at the reports and, and the things that I see with soldiers doing uh, downrange right now, uh, they're smarter, they're, they're, they're fit, they're intelligent, they, they're able to think outside the box. They are, well, they are ready, sir, so the, the change will be welcome. No, thanks, Sergeant Major. And then for, uh, for Kara Hawkins, um, since you're the youngest one in the group here, uh, what I would ask is, do you think our young leaders are prepared to handle more? Sir, I do. I think that it's, I think it's important to highlight our future battlefield with near-peer adversaries that that are, have modern militaries that are they understand cyberspace dominance, that there's going to come a time when there's teams on the ground. I think that through the mission command, like Sergeant Major mentioned, and, and just overall getting the decision-making confidence back in young leaders, uh, I think we are preparing our soldiers, and I think we will be prepared for, uh, for our future battlefield. So what, what skills, I mean, for, for Major Alexander, what skills do you see that our young leaders need to obtain um, in the future. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think it's, uh, I don't know if it is necessarily skill, sir. It's, it's almost, it is kind of harkens back to the trust that Sergeant Major Miller had, I think. Um, and, and maybe it's just experience, right. Getting pushed into those scenarios. And this is where the importance of training and validation pathways and, and scenarios that are testing us and not, um, not just forcing us to always get the right answer, but that are putting us into, into those tricky scenarios um, and situations that we may actually face overseas. But part of it is that are our leaders willing to trust us? Are you know sometimes I see that 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 there is a lot of you know there's a lot of risk when it comes to letting an O4 or an O3 or an E7 say, yep, I want to go into this town or I want to send out this text message. Uh, you know, I think there's, uh, I've heard a, a quote go around of um, a summer general officer say like, it's easier to, to shoot a hellfire than it is to send a text message to, to the population, right? And so some of that is, that some of that is what are our leaders willing to do? What are our authorities and policies that are, that are willing to allow that an O3, an O4, an E7, an E8 can make those decisions? I think they are prepared, or I think they have the ability to. We need to, we need to test them in that but we also need to have our leaders trust us to that. And we need to have those setups in place where that, you know, if, if the, the text maybe goes awry or, or a decision to talk to this one leader instead of another is maybe ends up not being the right, that they're not gonna get punished in the end, right? That there is breathing space to, um, 
uh, to maybe not necessarily make the, it's not a bad decision, but maybe it wasn't the best of the options, right? Um, so it is kind of a, a holistic change if, if we're really gonna do it. I, as, as you know, Karen and Chris said, we're ready. We're ready to make those changes. And I think, uh, you know, I've seen the, the captains and, and the young NCOs, they're ready to do it. Is everybody else ready for us to do it though, right? That's, that's part of that question. <laughs> So I'm going to ask uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bananer. So over in First Battalion, Third Group, you've been there for over a year now. So how do you and how do you best empower your young leaders? Well, I I hate to sound like the broken record here, but uh, we do talk a lot about trust and trying to display that trust. Um, we do try to develop training and education programs that uh, help them understand very complex and dynamic operational environments. Um, to help them exercise sound judgment um, and to identify uh, and mitigate risk uh, at all times. Uh, but those aren't technical skills, right? Uh, so a lot of it falls back on, on the attributes we select them for, the training and the education that we give them. But ultimately we as leaders have to trust and enable and empower them uh, to uh, go into those environments and fail, make mistakes, hopefully in training uh, and not in, in a real world environment and learn through their failure. It's not a zero defect uh, organization. It can't be uh, because we deal in the most complex and dynamic environments and we're asking them to do very difficult things. I think we have to be very careful in how we balance preparation and trust. Um, if we all are being honest with ourselves and we look back on our careers and our lives, how prepared was I when I took that first ODA into combat? How prepared was I truly when I took that first platoon into combat? You have to get the, the experience and thankfully we had leaders that trusted me and they supported me when we made mistakes. They gave us that top cover as long as we were operating within the intent and we understood the environment and we're making sound decisions or attempting to make sound decisions to accomplish the mission, take care of the men and women. Um, and, and I think that's hard to do. It's hard to protect against the zero defect culture that can creep in to set up training events that are built for uh, optimizing uh, successful outcomes instead of built for uh, leaders and units to learn through failure in a controlled environment. Um, so those are the things that we try to focus on. Uh, it, it's, it's not easy. Um, I wish there was a, a rubric or a, or a checklist we could put together that had, you know, some very simple tasks to get them prepared, but uh, those things don't exist. And ultimately you have to trust that we've got the right people, that we've trained them, we've educated them, and put them into the, the situations to succeed or fail and provide the top cover to support them and empower them. Yeah, so Carl, I agree with um, with everything you're saying. I mean, it really does boil down to, you know, you've got to create a challenging uh, and realistic environment for them to be challenged and, and uh, in some cases fail uh, and fail early and fail often, uh, which then they sit, step back, they take a look at it, they, they realize where their mistakes were and then they go back in and you send them back into the breach and you say, get after it. And then they learn from that. So that's great. The other one is, is just underwriting risk as a leader, right? So that's what we have to do is, is recognize that we're in a, we're, you know, in, in most cases, we're going to be leading our soldiers in the combat and we've got to trust them in everything that they do and be willing to underwrite those risks. And then also be prepared to mentor them and, and, and counsel them and, and let them know where their mistakes were, but also use it as a teaching point. So great comments. I'm gonna switch the gears a little bit. We're gonna talk about the future, the future of the Young Lions program. I wanna get your perspective. I'm gonna go out to Nicole to kind of see, you know, ask you, where do you see the program going in the future? Yeah, um, you know, I think it, it's gotta be the continued engagement and involvement, um, you know, opportunities to, for, for alumni to attend specific um, or targeted engagements, um, VTCs, um, 
maybe even opportunities to bring the alumni together. I mean, post COVID obviously, but you know, are there opportunities where we can be in a room and, and meet or we're, you know, we're learning through um, learning together or just re-engaging. Um, that's, that's an important part to me. And, and I think that's where we're headed um, is, is just con that continued engagement um, piece of it. So Sam, I want to jump on that too, if you don't mind, sir. Yeah, so just, I think it's like she said, it's calling on the cohort to, uh, even if it's just big or small problem, just to crash on that problem and bring us back together and, and breathe that strategic, that breathe that thinking. Um, I think that whether it's quarterly or, or just on an on call basis is, is pulling teams in and small teams, large teams and, and being able to crash on certain problem sets that first SFC is looking at, sir. So our major, um, what would you like to see the program uh, and how, where would you like to see the program in five years? Well, I would say right now, sir, uh, first special forces command and the young, uh, young lines program made history by having the first cohort of non-commissioned officers, but moving forward, um, the young lines program now has a responsibility to build this NCO young lines bench. I was amazed that the panel members today, how they talked about how they met in, in Pride two years ago, and they're still reaching out to one another to try to figure out these wicked problem sets. So just bouncing our ideas off of one another. So that, that's gonna be critical of building the, the Young Lions bench. Um, as, as we all know, uh, mentoring uh, our leadership, uh, mentoring uh, them to be better today is essential, but we now need to look at the future leaders. We need to go back in every uh, CSU on the First Special Forces Command, I would argue has a, uh, a charge to identify high performing NCOs to bring them uh, to know the Young Lions program and want to get out and try to compete to be a part of it, um, where their personal uh, goals are aligned with the organizational goals so they can spread that. As far as NCOs, we don't want to hold all of this information in. We want to spread it. I, I came back from the Young Lions program and I was talking to them about the things that I learned. That's where I want to see the program sir, in five years. Uh, just the same way that they're reaching back as NCOs are reaching back and me being a, a young old lion, you know, giving that, that mentorship to the new Young Lions, sir. No, great, great, Sergeant Major. I appreciate that. And then uh, to Brian Wong, um, how do you think the command can improve the young lines? You've been in the program for a while. How, how, where should we go? What steps should we take? What does the future look like for the program? For me, sir, it boils down to two things, really. I, I think the first one, and, and I think the command has already started down this path a little bit in some of the vision review pieces, but uh, for, for me, a lot of it comes down to how do we get the young lions 70% outside their comfort zone? Um, or 60% and really give them hard problems, challenging problems and see what they come up with um, and really let them take the gloves off and finding solutions. Um, and, and I think we can do that probably a little more across the board um, as we go forward and, and maybe as we go through maybe the next iteration of the innovation symposium um, is really how the young lines dig into a few pieces for that specifically. Um, I think the other piece as well too, um, and, and maybe just, uh, uh, Carl, Nicole, and I just happened to uh, get lucky on this one, but I think it comes down to how do we really truly manage the talent over time? And if you are identified as a young lion, hey, you are, you, I'm not saying you get an ASI, but you get some kind of internal identifier within the first SSC community or USASOC, and you get flight followed over time based off performance. And then you get looked at for either future investment or future key jobs. Um, uh, in addition to what's written on paper for your NCOERs or OERs going forward. And I think that would help get us away from some of the billet management we typically do. Understand that the CSL process is what it is, but there's a lot of other key jobs out there too that um, if we manage the talent over time based off who's in the cohorts, uh, we show that the program isn't just about um, uh, a really good LPD program or challenging problems. It's like, hey, this is an investment in you in the Sir, come on, those are some phenomenal ideas, if I can just say, like, put giving, you know, specific challenges instead of just kind of leaving it up to us or whatever, you know, first assist these input, but like, hey, I need you to attack, you know, pride, whatever, or these, you know, specific peoples from, from young, young lines, like this, cha this challenge of 
of information sharing or whatever it happens to be, doing it more concerted, directed um, effort is, is really great. And you know, and I think to the the talent management aspect of it is, um, you know, those are it, it speaks to kind of a larger issue of talent management, right? Is it really talent management? Is it just like billet management, as you say? And how do we continue to 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 show um, and progress people if we think maybe early on they they were they were pretty good and, and continue that investment into it? And I think you know, as I saw, it, uh, they spoke they spoke about in the last um, in the last episode of Indigenous Approach of different efforts that first SSD is taking on as well when it comes to exploring different career paths or or that investment or I guess and that investment in people and and it's definitely a, a really great point that you bring up sir uh, on kind of where what we can also do with those that are in young lines you, you know I, I hear a lot of you talking about uh, engaged leadership um, I hear you talking I like to call it intrusive leadership um, I think we all um, do much better when our leaders are kind of ha having a conversation with us, asking us what we are passionate about, where do we want to, where do we see ourselves in the next three to five years and maybe five to 10 years. And, and then, you know, figuring out what, helping them identify what their passions are and, and, and really what their, what their niche is and their niche of, of, and their strengths and weaknesses. And that's just really about having a conversation. So uh, for Sergeant Major Miller, let's talk a little bit about leadership and, and intrusive leadership. How do you, really get in uh in the conversation with your with your soldiers especially the young soldiers who may not be wanting to reveal anything to you how do you do that provide me some ttps well definitely uh sir your, your door uh always has to be open and you have to be approachable um and that 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 uh relationship is developed over time um you can't just come in and, and just let people do not let you into their world uh the very first day so basically being approachable, showing the human side of you. Uh, typically, a lot of people do not like talking to Sergeant Majors. Uh, just, they just don't. So you have to show that, hey, I am human. Just like you, I have a family. I have kids. I have young adults in college. I, I deal with the same problems that you deal with. And sometimes when you can just pull them off to the side and just have a, a personal conversation, it's like, OK, um, he's actually OK. And, and that, over time, allows him to open up. My, and I tell my guys, uh, anybody in my organization, my, my loyalty is not only to organizations, to individuals. So my door is always open, but they got to know that it, it can't be lip service. It can't just be a bumper sticker that you say, because people feel that. So just being personable, having your door always open and just being someone that you that is able to just field any question, uh, any just bouncing everything off, that's, that pays its weight and gold, especially in our organization, in our profession. You have to show that human side of you. I completely agree. I, I want to get a perspective from Kara, who is, uh, you know, you're an HHC commander in a uh, in a special forces battalion. How do you become intrusive, engaged leader in that battalion? Yes, sir. I think it's a lot of what Sergeant Major said. Is just getting, especially as officers, getting from behind your desk and just being present. When you're involved and engaged in, and whether it's PT or it's you know down at the motor pool or you know, you're down there and you, you hear a lot and you build relationships over time with, with individuals, you'll, you'll pull a lot out of them or either they'll just start, they'll, they'll trust you to talk to you. So then when those hard times do happen, when they have deaths in their family or, you know, something's going on with their spouse or their kid and, and you see a change at work and you think that you'll understand why and they'll tell you and they'll come forward and you'll be able to read them because you'll understand them and you'll know your, your individuals. So, sir, I think it's big on just being present. Okay, and then over to Carl. You, you've been uh, in command for a while now, so uh, and you've commanded at every uh, level in, in uh, I guess, in Third Special Forces Group. So how do you do it? Come in, give me some TTPs. Well, I, I think a lot of it has been said, uh, specifically following up on Kara's comments, uh, you've got to talk to people. Um, and it gets harder the, the higher you go. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, we have to make sure that uh, we we uh, not necessarily formalize it. You wanna be able to engage with people informally, but you schedule it. You make it part of the battle rhythm uh, that you are going to talk to people across the, the formation. My CSM and I have done some focus group discussions. We do the brown bag lunches, uh, you know, rotating by uh, different individuals from different companies. Um, and all those things just to stay engaged. And then when you do engage, it has to be meaningful. 
the key there, we, we talk about trust a lot. Uh, you know, they, all, all the soldiers in this battalion don't, don't have to like me, but they have to trust uh, that I am committed to mission accomplishment, committed to getting them ready uh, to accomplish that mission, committed to the unit and committed to the men and women. And I'm trying to make the best decisions possible. You can't establish that trust without honesty and transparency. Uh, so we try to be uh, absolutely honest and as transparent as possible with everybody when we do have those moments where we get to sit down and engage with them and ask them to do the same. I joke all the time that uh, the, the higher I go up the chain of command, the less people there are that are willing to tell me the truth. So I'm desperate for that candid, honest feedback. And I think when you give them honest feedback, when you are transparent, when you have those kind of personal conversations that the Sergeant Major talked about, um, you can get it back from them. But, but that would be the key, engagement. And then all the basic stuff that, that you should do in the Army. Counseling is important. Uh, sitting down and going over career goals and plans with soldiers is important. Uh, and so making sure that our junior leaders know what right looks like and they're actually doing those things. Um, you know, those doers will only do what the checkers check. So as at our level, I may not be able to reach the young private, but his or her first line supervisor certainly can, making sure that they're having those conversations and that those junior leaders are empowered and developed to have those conversations with soldiers. Yeah, you're right on. I mean, it, the transparency is critical. That requires us as leaders to over communicate in a lot of cases. Sometimes you do sound like a broken record. Um, but the truth is, is you've got to communicate at all levels uh, with all audiences and knowing your audience is, is, is critical also. It's also extremely important. You know, I always tell my folks, uh, you know, goals without plans are just dreams. So as you sit down and have those conversations with your, uh, with your teammates, is you know, have them identify those goals and then you figure out ways together on how you're going to uh, reach those goals and attain those goals. Um, I do, you know, appreciate everything that you guys, all the, the comments that you've provided. Um, you know, we have run out of time, believe it or not, for this episode. I want to thank everyone for discussions today um, and for your candid thoughts. Uh, this is an important topic because the things we're asking our soldiers to do around the world on a daily basis requires leaders who are at the top of their games. So we've done plenty of talking today, uh, but we really wanna hear your thoughts, your ideas. Please join the conversation on social media or feel free to reach out to us directly. Thanks again. This has been the Indigenous Approach. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Follow us on social media. If you have a suggestion for guests or topics, send us a message. Thank you for listening.